Equity in Progress. Hi. All right. Good afternoon to you. The, I'm calling in from uh, uh, England. And uh, my name is Terry Chiplin. I'm the event director for the US Trail Running Conference uh, and also for this webinar series. And uh, uh, thank you to everybody out there who's uh, uh, who's joining us now live for this webinar. Um, and um, yeah, very excited. We got uh, um, we got four panelists. Um, one we're still waiting to uh, connect in. So uh, um, I hope Kelsey Long is uh, is doing okay out there. Um, but um, uh, Kelsey Banaszinski um, from uh, and hopefully Kelsey, I said that name okay for you. Um, you nailed uh, it. Yeah, from from Colorado. Um, Patty Flynn from Chicago. And Joe McConaughey from, um, at the moment, Seattle, I guess, see Joe. Yeah, okay, all right. So um, thank you so much to everybody out there joining in. We look forward to a great session today. Um, our webinar today is gonna be uh, creating uh, a culture of respect for women on the trails and uh, um, is a really uh, uh, important piece, I think, of, uh, um, uh, of the, yeah, kind of respect for women on the trails is an important piece of, uh, of this sport. Um, and I think it's something that as a sport, we can do a lot better um, on. So I'm really excited to have uh, conversations on this um, with our panelists today. Um, I'm just going to enable the, oh, we have a Q&A. Yeah. Okay. So, so Noah, thank you so much. I'm just about to, uh, I'm just about to enable the chat. Um, so give me just a second and I will make sure that we can, Noah, if you wouldn't mind, if you're out, still out there, if you wouldn't mind, uh, um, popping something on the chat and we can just make sure that it's working for people out there. Um, so, um, thank you so much. Uh, I will, um, oh yeah. If you do have any questions as we're, uh, uh, going through, then please feel free, free to use the Q and A. Um, but, uh, but also, um, make sure to, uh, um, that if you want to put anything in the chat, then uh, make any comments in there too. So, um, a little bit of uh, um, housekeeping. Um, the first thing is that this series of webinar series is presented by our friends at Marathon Printing. So for those of you that don't know, Marathon Printing is a family owned company that specializes in producing custom printed items for endurance sports. And race bibs are their most popular item, either custom printed or stock bibs. Marathon Printing also supplies vital accessories for race directors like pins, bags, and pennant flags, as well as postcards, business cards, brochures, bumper stickers, and labels. And they have been a loyal supporter of the US Trail Running Conference since 2015, and are also an event standard partner for, for the American Trail Running Association. Um, and we are great, very grateful to Ryan Zirk and the team at Marathon Printing for their support of this webinar series. And it's only thanks to their support that we're um, we're able to. Oh, great! The chat's working. Um, we're, we're able to uh, not uh, make any charges for people to access this webinar series. And then finally, this particular session is sponsored by our friends at Darn Tough Vermont, and they're, as you probably know, a premium manufacturer of outdoor running and lifestyle socks, and backed with a highly unusual, unconditional guarantee for life. And as socks are essential to the trail running community, the company has prioritized its efforts to support this community and sponsoring recent industry events and races. So again, we're also thankful to, uh, um, to Darn Tough Vermont as well for their support. Okay, right. Enough of the, uh, <laughs> enough of the sponsor, uh, sponsor talk. Let's, uh, um, let's get into the, uh, the session itself. So, I'm going to share my screen now for, okay, so Kelsey, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see the uh, screen share there? Okay, thank you. Um, so, as I said, presented by Marathon Printing, um, the uh, session sponsor, Darn Tough, and so, so this is the um, order we're going to run things in today for the session. So, um, Kelsey Banaszinski is going to lead off. Um, uh, Patty Flynn. Oh, sorry, I didn't change your your title on that. So apologies for that. I'll get that. Yeah, I'll get that changed on the uh, on the update for this. Um, Kelsey Long and I hope Kelsey is going to be joining us. 
um, and uh, um, Joe uh, last in line. And uh, any Q and A on the way through, then feel free to um, feel free to drop that on the Q and A or the chat. Okay, so Kelsey, you're going to be first up. Um, so uh, um, where is this picture taken? I'm guessing this is in Colorado somewhere. It is. That's in uh, Buena Vista at the start line of the West Line Winder. So it's actually a race that's happening this Saturday. We're getting ready for it right now. Whoa, excellent. Good, good. I hope the uh, race goes well for you, Kelsey. I'm sure it will. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'll let you uh, um, I'll let you move on from here. Um, please feel free to take over and I'll, I'll mute myself and the, um, the floor is yours. Thanks, Terry. And thanks everyone for joining today. Um, so as my intro slide said, I am um, one of the actually co-founders for Freestone Endurance. Me and my husband, Caleb Efta, put that on. Um, we're probably most known for our 100 mile race out here known as the High Lonesome 100, which started back in 2017. Um, and we've really used that as a catalyst to drive conversation and make change um, in this world of trail running. So. You know, one of the things obviously that has been a big conversation and why we're here today is that we're seeing women participate at much lower rates um, in trail and ultra running, especially as the distances in the races increase. So on average, especially for a hundred mile race, you're seeing the amount, the percentage of women um, around 20%. And we think that's wrong, right? And I think with High Lonesome, um, we'll get into a little bit more in the next couple of slides, but um, I think the way to look at this problem and the way we've thought about it is starting with, well, why? Why is that happening? Um, and there's a number of different reasons. I'm not going to be able to touch on all of them today, but one of the biggest is access and inclusion. So starting from the get-go at early ages, girls have much fewer opportunities to play in sports, and they're much less funded um, than boys in, in sports that men are participate in. We also see a lot of safety and transportation issues. And then what we find um, becomes a really big part of the conversation, especially for the longer distance races, is time and distribution of work. And so I've added a couple of citations here, but there's obviously a lot more. This isn't a very in-depth research paper, a couple of slides, but it is important, I think, to bring um, data and facts to this conversation. So especially for time and distribution of work, we see women uh, taking on way more of the unpaid household and community care to the point where it adds up to somewhere around maybe 15 hours per week. And so when you think about that in terms of training and, uh, you know, having hobbies or doing other activities, uh, women just have less time to do it because they're taking on this unpaid work. So all of these things um, drive into access and inclusion. And I'll talk about that in a second, how we've addressed that in our events. Terry, you can flip to the next slide. Uh, and I'll mention this too. If anyone has any questions or um, as I'm talking, you know, please feel free to chime in. Happy to pause and, and talk as we go. So some of the other big key parts too that are impacting women in, in trail and ultra sports are visibility. So there's a lack of positive role models uh, for women and in leadership positions in events. Um, which creates an institutionalized gender inequality within these organizations or our organizations. And then, of course, messaging. Uh, a lot of stereotyping happens because of social norms. Um, and it's wild to me, right? Because even just this year, I've seen articles come out talking about how women don't want to be challenged in the same way as men. That's why they're not participating or they're, they just aren't up for the same level of risk as men. And uh, it's just forgive my words, bullshit. Um, so, you know, I think we need to really work together strongly to, to tackle that and consider that, especially our allies um, out there in the field. And, and so it really creates this message that women are fragile, less capable and passive, and it's just not true. It's unfounded. You can flip to the next slide, Terry. Okay, so what can we do as organizations and what have we at Freestone been doing? So first of all, for access and inclusion, really taking a look at the structure of your race. What are the policies you have? Um, what are the qualifiers, the logistics and prize money? So for example, you know, Highland Sum, I think you've probably, if you know us, you've heard a lot about our lottery entrant policy, 
where we've split our field and held spots 50% for men, 50% for women, um, which has been really received incredibly by the community. I think that there were a handful of detractors, but what we've shown over the last couple of years is if you hold the spots, women come. Now, our policy isn't something that works for everyone, and that's what you should keep in mind as I talk through all of these things, right? When you're looking at your organization or you're talking to organizations in your area and wanting them to make change, the solutions are different for everyone. And so the 50-50 lottery split was really what made the most sense for us um, and has made a really big impact. Besides that, we've we implemented at the same time a pregnancy and new child policy. So uh, again, like time and, and when you look at the people who are running trail and, and long distance ultra races, a lot of them are in childbearing or family starting ages. And so giving folks um, the ability to defer their entries so that they can still live their life and also give them time to recover is really, really important to keeping women um, and, and childbearing individuals in the sport in general. Qualifiers are also another big place that you can make an impact. Um, for us, we have a um, 50 mile qualifier uh, that you can choose. Um, it's not ours, just saying like you can run a 50 mile race and that qualifies you, right? So it takes a lot of time and effort um, and energy and resources to run 100 mile races. And we found that one 50 milers can prepare you for ours. And we wanna give that opportunity um, to runners. It really just opens up the field a little bit more. We also allow runners to run our 50-50 race, which is actually happening this weekend. So it's back to back 50 K. So really just taking a look at, you know, how can you accomplish the goal for us with qualifiers, right? Is making sure runners are prepared and is the only way to go about that, making them run another hundred mile or hundred K. And I think the answer for us at least is no, but again, it's different for every race, but I think that's just another area people need to consider um, when they're setting up their events. And then in general logistics. So what kind of opportunities are you offering to runners and what's the message you're sending, right? So um, I think you'll see, and you have heard, there's a lot of organizations that talk about this outside of races. Um, you know, how do we make sure there's, you know, equal visibility on the start line, that there's opportunity for family access or breastfeeding access along the course? Um, are there menstruation products at your aid stations? Um, you know, I think there's a number of different ways to, again, to go about that, but all of those small signals encourage runners to come and, and realize that your event is, is there to support them. And of course, prize money. And I think this has gotten better, certainly in the U S um, we don't have prize money for our races, our events. Um, but it is a really important topic for other ones and making sure that what you're offering is equal to each party that's partaking um, in your event. And then in, to support all of that, right, the information that you're providing runners as well. So what kind of, are you sharing this on your website? Are you showing that you're approachable? Are you communicating that you have all these opportunities um, and support methods for them as they're coming into the race. We've also found that, you know, preview runs, camps, and Q&A sessions are really helpful as well. And I really think this goes for not just bringing up the um, participation of women, but it's increasing diversity in general, right? So taking a step back and, and really looking at, well, like, what might be the pain points of my race for women and for other, other underrepresented groups? Um, that may make them feel like they can't come. And so these are all kind of good options that you could use and implement quite easily, frankly, um, to try and send that message and support people a little bit more. And then finally, community con connectivity, right? So making sure that you are working with members of your community, making sure people feel invited um, and really growing your network because there's only so much you can do as one or two or three or even five people in a race organization. Um, spreading out the strength of your network is really gonna help capture and bring people into the fold and make them feel like they can and want to be there. And so for us, that's looked like partnering with um, female-led 
trail running groups, both in our area and in Colorado, inviting them to come run aid stations, as an example. Um, even if people aren't feeling like they want to run or the distance isn't theirs, getting them to just be at the event and get comfortable with it is another way to just increase opportunity and awareness that this is something that they could do, right? Like one of the things that I've heard a lot is even just coming out to volunteer and, and having watching who's running, people will walk away from it saying, oh my gosh, okay, I guess those people look just like me. Um, I, I guess I could do this. Like, let me think about that. And then maybe they'll jump into a lower distance race and it just snowballs from there, right? So I think all of these different touch points are important and it's, and it's important to have a variety of them because there's just no one size fits all both for runners or for events in general. You can hop to the next one. And of course, visibility and messaging, right? So your race day coverage, what are you showing on social media? How are you talking about the events? For us, we talk about the, when we have a race, we talk about two races actually happening at once, a men's race and a women's race. Um, and that has really received a lot of excellent feedback. I think that is how people are thinking about it. Um, and, it's, and it's helpful to cover it and talk about it that way. Um, what does your start line look like? So really encouraging, you know, and again, this kind of plays into that, how your general marketing and your photography shows up during and after the race. Um, but I think historically, right, we've seen a lot of marketing and photos of events and races show one type of runner. And so making sure that people feel comfortable stepping up and being there at the start line and, and being there with you so that that then, you know, encourages other people to join, right? When they, when you see someone like yourself at an event, you're more likely to go to it. And then especially for us, race leadership and focusing on that and, and how we have engaged people in our organization has been really important. So we have a group of directors that are the main kind of organizers of the event. And then underneath the directors, we have aid station captains and then general volunteers. And so for our group of directors and aid station captains, we've really focused on making sure that we have a really um, good distribution and equal distribution of women and men on our teams. Um, one of the things that we changed in the last couple of years was adding a secondary aid station captain to each of our sites. And part of that was to help bring in more people and more diverse people. Um, but then secondarily, it also helps take some of the weight right off of the team. But that's been a really, really helpful and um, more positive change than I think we we expected um, it to have. And it's been, again, like another way to just like grow people's confidence that they deserve to be here, they can be here, and that, you know, they can also run these events besides volunteer at them. And then, of course, your messaging, right? This is kind of ties into some of the things I said on visibility, but how are you marketing your race? What are the photos that you're using? What is the language that you're using? Um, who are you connecting with on social media? All of it makes a big difference. Um, and then, of course, like leaning into the education to combat myths. So not letting people run the conversation of, well, you know, when you make some policy changes or you change some things about your event, um, you know, and especially for us, when we made our lottery changes, we had a lot of people chattering about how, you know, there, this doesn't make sense. Like there really aren't barriers for women. Nobody's stopping women from signing up to your events. And um, that's just not a narrative we want to let continue because it really masks and and detracts from the issues that are out there today like i've talked about so making sure one that you continue the conversation and continue to educate people and build allies that can help um you know not make you the only one in this conversation right like i think we all need to be taking a part in how we discuss what are the hurdles and and how we can um you know come over them. So that's kind of it. That's my shtick. Uh, any, any main questions for me? Yeah, we got, uh, we got one question here okay. from, uh, from Noah out there and Noah, thank you so much for this. Um, he says, uh, I love this point. Um, in bike races, we call riders up to the line. Um, mm -hmm. Have you seen running or trail races do this? 
offer individuals that represent the diversity of your runner base to be at the forefront of your start line photos. How could that look? Um, so that's a really interesting point. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do that at the start line. Um, we, you know, a couple minutes before we'll start maybe like walking through the crowd and encouraging people to step up to the front. We also widened our start line. That helps. I think one of the things that was, you know, bottleneck for us was the literal like narrowness of our start line. So making that wider, uh, making sure at least for us, right, you tell runners, I think sometimes, at least for me, the reason I don't want to be at the start is because I'm not a fast runner and I don't want to be the bottleneck to other people. But for us, and you can think about this too, as you set up your race, can you have a half a mile of road or something that's wider that really encourages people to feel more confident being up there? Because if it's not a single track, it doesn't really matter what speed it is. There's plenty of room to pass. So I think, you know, that's kind of one of those more structurally logistic things um, that if you can incorporate into your setup, that also I think makes people feel more comfortable. Cause it is a, sometimes an awkward thing to like point at people five minutes before the start and say, why don't you come stand up here? You're, you look like you're, you're a woman, right? Um, you're singling people out and that's not always like the best way to go about it. Um, so I think there's things you can do uh, in the lead up that make it feel more organic and um, just a part of the race, you know, versus a forced thing. Cool, cool. Great question, Noah. And uh, thank you, Kelsey, for the response there. Um, so, um, yeah, just to uh, for those uh, um, uh, those people that are interested in uh, contacting all of our panelists, then we're going to be sharing the inf contact information um, on the slide deck. And uh, um, we'll also be uh, sharing the uh, recording of the session tomorrow. And I'll be sending out the slide deck as well. So you'll have a, um, an aid memoir to, uh, to contact people there. So uh, um, uh, we have another chat. All right. Um, yeah, Noah says another point about race photos. Sometimes race photos are expensive. Sometimes they're free with attribution or really affordable, um, e.g. knee necker. This could help people who have a budget to get and share more. Hmm, interesting point. <laughs> race photos are expensive. I mean, to be honest, that is where we spent a good amount of our money in the last, um, in the, well, in the first couple of years of the event. But it is a really, I think there's a, there's a number of ways, right, you can go about it um, to make it more cost effective. And I will say it's it's a very, very helpful marketing tool, right? Like being able to show people who's there and also what your race course or race event is like. I don't, like as people say, pictures are worth a thousand words. Um, I think it's a very worthwhile place to invest. But I think you could also, if you don't have the funds, you could call for people in the community to come out. You could do a photo competition. I mean, I think you can get creative with it if you're having a hard time bringing photographers on, but I do think um, it, it solves a number of, or it gets to helping solve a number of problems that you might have. Oh, okay, wonderful. Kelsey, thank you so much. Really appreciate you being on this uh, um, on this session. And uh, um, yeah, please stand by in case we get some more questions that we need you back for us. So, um, okay, Patty, we are next up. And and I'm so glad you sent me this picture. I mean, this is uh, in terms of a picture, you know, so so <laughs> says a thousand words. But uh, um, yeah, I love that. Uh, that's great. So is, is this uh, somewhere near you in Chicago? Yes, it's um, Swallow Cliff. Um, I we don't have many hills out here, so right. when I do get ill, I have to go up and down it a lot. But this actually is in the flat, so this is in my preparation for um, Trans Rockies last oh, year. Cool. Um, and I was one of my loops where I wasn't going up and down a hill. I didn't take any pictures of the hills or the giant set of stairs that I went up and down. It was not fun. I hate that area. <laughs> 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 okay, cool. And for those for those that maybe can't see it, it's uh, it's a U.S. trail running conference hat that Pat Patty is styling as well. So uh, Shame, uh, shameless plug. Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right, Patty. I'll hand the uh, hand the deck over to you. So just give me a shout when you're ready to move on. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I, I just had to say, Kelsey, thank you for um, stealing all of my content. Uh, joking, but like you're spot on with a lot of the the. Um, solutions. So I'll, I'll touch a little bit on that at the end, but 
I do want to talk just kind of at the start. There's there's a lot of bigger issues at play in our world right now with regards to um, what is going on um, with how women and and I'm going to talk a little bit about the LGBTQ um, and LGBTQ community and people who are don't consider themselves women, but are not also are also not cisgender men. Um, and so, you know, there is a lot of push right right now um, by a certain set of political factions in the United States um, that are making it a little bit more difficult for um, folks to uh, be themselves in public in general. Um, and so that does translate to um, safety on the trails. Um, you know, as, as I think we're all aware, um, most endurance sport is heavily populated with cisgender white men and most people. And let me real quick give you a definition in case you don't know what cisgender might mean. Cisgender means that you are, uh, you present yourself in the same gender as you were born. Um, I'm transgender, so I didn't look this way my whole life. Um, but I, uh, six years ago or so, um, I realized who I was. And so I transitioned, um, which is kind of funny because I ran trans Rockies a couple times too. And that's it. The word trans just means across from, and cis means same as. So, um, but you know, it, it's there's a there's a certain amount of safety that um, is is being lost right now. Uh, the Dobbs decision um, has definitely caused a, a little bit of a rise of um, some level of fragile masculinity. I hate using like the toxic masculinity, fragile, fragile masculinity, and and pointing the fingers at people like Andrew Tate or some of the other uh, acolytes of his that are really spreading a lot of misogyny. Um, folks who are messaging um, anti-trans sentiment, a lot of that is rooted in misogyny as well. The whole perception that men are just better than women. And so even though trans women are women, they don't believe that. And they believe that trans women are men. <laughs> and that because they believe that someone like me is a man, that I'm always going to win. Um, and, and again, that is just all rooted in the misogyny. And that that's really these bigger issues of like safety have to do with this prevailing attitude. Um, and, it, and it goes through and, and some, some groups of women have even invested in this as well. Um, the Save Women Sports Group is really interested in making sure that someone like me can't compete in a women's category. Um, and no matter what your position is um, on my existence, um, I do exist and I don't win anything. And I can guarantee you that I did not make a transition just to try to win some things. Um, it, <laughs> if I did, it was a really big miscalculation. Um, so let, let, let's click through to the next, uh, next bullet. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about gender expression on the trails. and. And because I'm talking about not just women's safety, but really all marginalized genders. And, and this is something that I um, brought up to my cycling team. Um, we offer grants for entry for people to ride in races. Um, you know, as was brought up in Kelsey's presentation, you know, there are more barriers for women. Um, you know, one of the barriers for women and other folks who are not cisgender white men is that um, we tend to not have as much ability to pay, for, even pay for entries. Um, and so my cycling team offers grant programs for 
BIPOC cyclists, and also we call it the gender equity grant for people who are of a marginalized gender, whether you're a trans, a trans man, whether you're a non-binary person, um, whether you're uh, a non-binary femme person or you're non-binary more masculine, those we, we tend to not have access. So um, I really tried to focus on this as something that, you know, when you see someone out on the trail, you can't assume who they are. Um, and because there's, everybody presents themselves a little differently. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say that as it, the, the clothes that I wear on the trail, the clothes that I'm wearing today are quote unquote feminine, you know, and, and but there is a certain amount of femininity that is presented by all genders on trails. And so, um, you know, androgynous folks uh, are out there, um, women running in sports bras or crop tops. Um, and so there are, are all these factors that, um, you know, and I keep talking about this and, and, and this really kind of clicks into the next point. Um, that's your hint, Terry. Um, that, we need to change this language around this. So even, even I'm talking about like what I'm wearing or what this other person who is uh, marginalized um, and it's, we put the, the weight of all this on that person. Um, and so I really would like us to start, and, and this is at some level part of the solution, don't click through yet. Um, but we need to reframe this conversation so it's not, you know, like a woman, and, you know, this is, this is not the first time this has been discussed and this is not the only spot to discuss this about, but like, you know, it's not about what a woman is wearing or, you know, like Patagonia, a drag queen who is very famous in the, the outdoor space sponsored by, um, I think ironically North Face um, and possibly REI, but you know, like it, it's not about what we're doing and what we're wearing. Um, it, because that, that kind of discussion takes the agency away from uh, a woman like me, um, a cisgender woman, a trans man, uh, someone who is not looking like, you know, what you're supposed to look like on the trail. And so giving agency back to folks in, in putting the onus back on the, the people who are not marginalized to maybe change their behavior, which really gets us into the ideas for how do we resolve this? You know, what, what can we do? And a lot of that was discussed by, if that's the, that's the next, next point. Um, a lot of this was discussed by Kelsey. I mean, I, I can't, I can't say enough about the, the things, Kelsey, that you said, and and I and I knew High Lonesome had had some of this, and I, I'm really, I'm actually it was when when you started talking about it, I was very excited that I get the chance to be on a panel with you because that's the those are the kind of solutions that need to happen, um, and and it's taking up you know clubs and, and events need to take on this responsibility to to change these conversations. Um, making explicit statements, whether it's in person, social media, on your website, you know, burying these statements and this and and your perspectives on a DEI page or somewhere deep in your website that's not enough. Um, because the majority of people want inclusion. There are people that don't. There are people that are exclusive. They want those exclusive, exclusive spaces. And they're not the, the main voice. And when an, uh, a, an event or a sport capitulates to that, it actually hurts more than, you know, they think it's going to help because that's their market. But the, the times are changing. Gen Z is, you know, they're, they're identifying themselves as more queer um, or just interested in inclusion and diversity in general. And that's the next set of people coming to events. So having this 
inclusivity really readily visible and standing behind it, I think is really, really important. Holding space, like Kelsey mentioned, about holding slots aside or having early entry. And you know, I know some of the cycling events that I go to um, have open up for uh, women to enter the race a week before and hold that space so that they have an opportunity to sign up before everybody else does of other marginalized genders. And like, also, like this is an individual thing. We need to say people who are not of a marginalized gender, allies of the LGBTQ community, men, we need to stop letting things slide. Um, a funny joke may not be a funny joke. Um, saying something that's not, not acceptable or shouldn't be acceptable, that is harmful or potentially, you know, like joking about women's bodies, joking about um, treating women poorly, talking poorly about women or other people that aren't, you know, the norm. We can't let that slide because that says, when, you, when we let that slide, when that says, that says to the person saying that, that that's okay, that says to everybody else around that person that I think it's okay and somebody may look up to me and because I didn't say something, then they're gonna assume that I back that. We need to start standing up and saying, no, this is enough. And it's happening, but it needs to keep moving. Um, I saw that there was a question, and I'm sorry yeah, to pull up the yeah. chat. So, so, Patty, I don't know if you can see it, but um, um, uh, Noah also says uh, uh, a question for you. Um, in our race registration, we use categories of men, women, other, and prefer not to say. I still see races with just male and female. What is your recommendation for this at the moment? Right. Um, so I would say... Um, if you are going to have a non-binary category, I would not list other or prefer, I would keep prefer not to say. What I really like and what the race that I am the director of is I like to have a men's, a women's, a non-binary category. And then a fourth category, which we instituted in our race this year, it's not, which is not a trail race, or um, I'm sorry, last year, we didn't hold it this year. Um, it's a, just a, a participant. There's so many of us that just don't care. We, we don't, we want to have a time, but like the placing doesn't matter. Um, you know, it, it's not about that. It's about going out, but it also leaves space for those people. You know, there, I would have loved a participant ca category when I was kind of in a spot where I didn't feel comfortable registering in the women's category. And I would not have felt comfortable registering in a non-binary category because that wasn't and isn't my identity. And so, yeah, you're like, well, that's a lot of categories. Well, I mean, some races have a bunch of categories, whether it's gender plus age group or juniors and, and different, like in cycling, there's um, category one, two, three, four, five. You know, there's all kinds of ways that we slice and dice our our timing and our categorization. I would just say that if you're going to also offer a non-binary category, that you really consider making sure that, you know, like the if there's prize money, that you consider prize money on equal terms, that you consider awards on equal terms. And if that means that everybody who's in a non-binary category gets an award, gets prize money, that for, you know, then then really understand that that might be the case, um, and so you know there are, there are um, there are some uh, resources out there. I'm part of a Queer Running Society, so go check that out. That's that's got some resources on on that. Um, I'm part of the uh, I'm the director of education for that, and I'm working to help events be more inclusive for LGBTQ folks. So, um, you know, just connect that way or connect with my email and I can help out. Um, and so I appreciate the time here. And I know that, you know, I don't want to take up everybody's time because I, 
I'm, I'm looking at my watch, so I'll let this move on. But I do want to say that race photos being free is awesome and that my race did that. Cool. Patty, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we got Patty's uh, um, uh, Patty's connection uh, details here. Um, so uh, um, yeah, thank you so much, Patty. Appreciate you uh, um, battling through your uh, your voice issues there. So thank you so much. Um, you. Okay, Kelsey, you're next up. And I'm gonna ask you to unmute because I did mute you earlier. So um, there we go. Okay. Hey, good afternoon. Good morning. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kelsey. My pronouns are she, her. I am Navajo, and my clans are Kia'ani Nishlin, Klogabusha Shim, Kidlachitni Dushache, Nakai Dina'e Dushanela. So that was just letting everyone know who my family is and where I come from. I'm originally from New Mexico, but I live in Southeast Oklahoma on the Choctaw Nation Reservation. So I wanted to talk today about uh, this, this topic, creating a culture of respect for women on the trails, um, but more specifically, women of color on the trails. Um, I am the co-founder of the uh, Dirt Bags Run Team. It's a Black, Indigenous, and people of color running team seeking to expand our presence in the sport while honoring Indigenous lands, amplifying diversity at races and beyond. We move to protect and heal our people and advocate for safety, inclusivity, and respect in trail running spaces. My best friend and business partner, Rebecca Bowman, and I created this team because we saw a need for community, saw a, a need for community for BIPOC runners. We've heard over and over that everyone is welcome in running. You just need some shoes. Um, but that's not particularly the case uh, because it does not address the historical trauma runners of color have faced. People of color were not allowed, and there were even laws that created to keep people of color out of outdoor spaces for recreation. So now we would like explicit invitations rather than general welcome statements if you want us to be at your event. What that looks like is doing some research and finding local BIPOC groups and opening up a line of communication so that they know that you want them at your event and you'll do your best to make sure that they're safe. And I think one of the easiest things you can do is moderating comments on social media. Um, that is one of the easiest way you can, you can show the community, uh, women, BIPOC women, that they'll be safe at your, your event because you are making sure that, um, that the trolls <laughs> don't take over the comment section. So the next thing I have is uh, going beyond land acknowledgements. I think that is something that a lot of races uh, events are, are doing right now. And I, I love seeing it. However, it does seem to be performative if it's not connected with anything else. What that looks like is reaching out to the community. How can you? How can that event give back to the community? Um, and uh, you know, using resources like um, NativeLand.net, I believe it is, and um, uh, and 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 finding out whose lands you're recreating on, and reaching out to those communities and seeing what you can do to help that community instead of take away from it. Um, so, and then the, the last thing I have is uh, the, some of the bar removing barriers. The Dirtbags Run Team, that was one of the missions we had or, or one of the uh, priorities we had with creating this team. It is not just a team to bring together um, these people and and push them into a race it was to make sure that they were as successful as they could be d during that event so uh we cover race registration lodging travel during race weekend food during race weekend and I, those four things um so we removed a financial barrier barrier by doing that 
we remove a safety barrier because um, pe people of color aren't always accepted uh, by the locals in outdoor spaces, but there is safety in numbers. So we created a community with our runners um, leading up to our uh, annual event. We have um, monthly uh, monthly calls. So we we started out as strangers when we first started the team, and we've become really great friends because we have each other to lean on during race weekend. Um, and that uh, safety was one of the biggest things that we we wanted to uh, um, let our runners know that they they could rely on um, because we picked them up from the airport if they were flying in. Um, we made sure that they didn't have to go through tiny towns with, uh, you know, the flags of the former president flying around by themselves. We were there to be to, to just help them and, and make them feel safe. So those are the kind of barriers that we are looking to remove um, through this team and that we hope that other um, uh, race directors, um, run clubs, events, sees and are willing to address. So I'm, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Kelsey, brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, I love um, um, I love that comment about uh, comments in social media um, because you know linking into what Patty said. Then I think that's another um, that's a, another way we can really interrupt letting it slide um, because that's another place where I think it's easy to let things slide in some ways. Um, but giving people the the opportunity um, to respond in a positive way rather than a negative way. Um, I think is, uh, um, you know, really ties in with um, with exactly what Kelsey and Patty were saying as well in terms of, you know, we need to change the language, we need to change the narrative, we need to change the behavior, because that's really what we're looking to do, isn't it? Um, so, so, so thank you, Kelsey, that was, uh, that was brilliant. Great to hear the work that you're doing. And uh, um, yeah, kudos to you. And thank you so much for, um, so um, just to let you know that, uh, um, um, Kelsey, I hope this is okay. But um, uh, she, uh, um, Kelsey reached out to me and said, uh, um, said, hey, I've, I've seen your webinar. And, uh, and she said, uh, um, uh, you know, would, uh, um, uh, do you have uh, um, any women of color on the, uh, um, on the panel? And, and I was like, at that moment, I didn't. And, but I had been looking and it was like, brilliant. You know, it's, it's you know, sometimes how you make a decision and, and Providence moves. Um, and so it was, Kelsey, you, you kind of answered my prayer um, in a way. And, uh, and I'm so glad you could join us today. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay. Joe, thank you so patiently, patiently waiting. Um, and uh, um, yeah, I'll, uh, um, uh, I'll hand over to you now for the floor. Um, and um, uh, I don't think we got any more questions at this moment. So yeah, I'll, uh, I'll pass over to you and uh, um, just let me know when you want me to move along. Perfect, Terry, you're in ready to rock. All right. Um, so my name is Joe McConaughey. I live in Seattle, Washington. I am a trail runner for Brooks, uh, running coach, don't have any race um, organization experience. So I feel like my conversation and topics are going to come more from the participant or infrastructure and running industry side of things. Um, before I jump into two topics, it's just kind of um, uh, fun to acknowledge that I'm here, right? And I think Patty did a good job talking about that of, of this conversation isn't about, you know, making women create a culture of respect for women, right? Um, it's it's important to branch out and to involve people in on this conversation. I, I was in on this, um, a similar panel um, on creating culture of respect for women on trails last year. And I was very nervous, right? I was like, what? I'm the guy, I'm the guy. <laughs> I'm the, uh, you know, white cis male who's here to tell you about how to, how to make things inclusive for women, which was very uncomfortable to me. Right. And it had a lot of, a lot of things, um, about, uh, you know, a lot of conversations about inclusivity, 
Um, but doing so in a public space, right, and involving me in that that conversation, I, I think the, the my my way that I think about myself on this panel is I'm I'm not here to be the voice, right, for for this topic. Um, but it is important that I am a voice, or that there is a you know white cis male as a voice in the conversation, um, because uh, without it, you know, we're not bringing the whole community together. So, um, and I also wanted to reflect on a few things that some of the other um, lovely panelists mentioned, which, you know, I'm very grateful to be on this, this panel and to hear uh, some really awesome um, topics and, and points being made. Um, and I'll start with um, Kelsey Long. Um, I think a, a really important one. So part of my experience come from, we have a local trail running club called Cowgill Trail Collective in, um, in Seattle here. And it's, it's a very kind of fast growing group. There's like over 2000, Instagram followers and like a, th a thousand people or so who, who identify as in the club. Um, and, uh, you know, one, one thing that we struggled with for a while was that explicit invitation to create a more broad community. Right. And I think that's really important, um, is to create those conversations and communities and recognize that there are other groups of people and also individuals out there and to try to collaborate and work together and, and have some, you know, co-mingling, but an important part about those invitations is you also need to show up for those people who you're inviting to your events. Um, I think one of the biggest fallbacks we have is, yeah, we, you know, organize a trail run uh, or a, a run in the center of Seattle. That's a workout, right? But that's where a lot of people who can afford to live in the heart of Seattle, who can show up at 630 on a Wednesday, AM on a Wednesday go, right? Where that's not going to draw on a broader um, group of people, right? Even if we're inviting them to our place, we should be showing up to these other groups who we want to, um, to be and feel comfortable and, and respected in our groups. Um, we should be expanding those invitations and also showing up for them. So I thought that was a great point by Kelsey. Another um, experience that really resonated with me from what Patty said is um, the non-binary category. I've coached multiple athletes uh, in non-binary who participated in or I guess coached and, and no athletes who participated in non-binary categories. And I think more often than not, it's been a negative experience. Um, and that's because it, it largely, it, to the to the individual, it's largely felt like a performative gesture, um, you know, uh, from everything from race volunteers who they're like, I'm in the non-binary category. And they're like, wait, do we give you the male or the female size t-shirt or, right? Um, that having a, if you're going to have a non-binary category, make sure you're, you're creating an event that respects and, and honor those participants. Um, even though you do have to start somewhere, right? I don't think you can expect to knock it out of the park. Maybe your first time having a, a new category. Um, but, you know, having a little bit of extra thought and care to making it a creative space is, is really important. Um, and then lastly, I, I think it was really fun to hear, um, Kelsey Banaszynski's conversations just on um just on um like organizational structure around a culture of respect in women I feel like a lot of what happens from these conversations and from people who are interested in this kind of work is there's a lot of talk about creating things but then people don't go to that next level um step of creating thoughtful policies and inclusions um around it so to me, that's a really big step and an intimidating one and one that, uh, you know, I guess my advice to anyone is to try to find people who, who you know, throw these ideas off other people, right, and see what they think and, and think of actual um, procedures and policies or structures and ways that you can create that in an organizational sense, not just in something that you talk about in, in simply language alone. All right, so I'll try to keep my points um, to the point. Um, my, my first point being uh, expanding leadership in running clubs and companies. Um, you know, one thing you see, there's a lot of people who look like me in leadership roles <laughs> in running clubs um, and in the outdoor industry and in the running industry. So I think it's just really, to me, it's really important to actively um, promote, um, you know, females into and women into um into those positions and to bring people into the mix and into the fold um, and have a, a broad um, sort of leadership or diverse leadership group 
um, and to also just be really cognizant of that, right? Like our, one of our issues here in Seattle with that um, organization that was Cowgill, it was, it was started by three men, right? And so that was just how this club grew organically. Uh, and it took a little while before, you know, other uh, more diverse types of leadership started getting in incorporated into the fold. So I think there should, to me, it's a, a the biggest thing you can do is involving, you know, a diverse group of people in the sort of like high up or, you know, positions of power um, within different organizations. Um, specifically for me, a really interesting one is increasing the number of female coaches. Um, I was on a, um, a very prominent, probably the most popular kind of like running coach program, service program, I guess you could call it. And uh, I was doing the simple math of um, people who I who I believe identify as male versus female, and a less than um, less than a third of the coaches um, I think I believe identify as female. So um, that's a good stat, right? When you're thinking about uh, you know female participants, a lot of the people who are giving advice, you know, a lot of the people who have outspoken social media accounts around how to coach or how to run well are often male um, and they're often very dogmatic and it's it's not necessarily approachable for a lot of people. However, uh, you know, those are the voices that people often listen to. Um, so uh, in the in the trail running world, right, there's a, there's a big lack of um, female coaches. Uh, I run a, um, a scholarship for aimed at trying to provide free coaching for um, for sort of younger trail runners, um, to ages like 20 through 30. Um, and an important thing after the first two years was realizing like, whoa, or after the first year was like, whoa, we, I need more female coaches to broaden kind of the, the matchmaking process. Right. Um, so that was a big goal. And then, you know, you look at it and it's like, wait, there aren't that many female, I don't know if that many female co coaches, like what, holy, holy crap. And then, you know, you could say the, the same thing about um, BIPOC coaches, right? When you think about people who are facilitating people into, um, uh, into you know, the running space, uh, making sure that we're, we're thinking about cultivating those future leaders, right? Um, and then we'll go to the last point, Terry. Um, and then lastly, uh, creating an inclusive space in running communities. Um, I think one thing I've learned working with Calgill and All In, um, and this uh, I think is important because a lot of trail running communities are naturally exclusive. Um, you know, a lot of runners who are newer to running who are thinking, oh, I want to run a 50K. You know, a lot of people are like, wow, you have to be probably like an elite level athlete to run over a marathon on trails right? Naturally, trail running is going to be an intimidating space for someone who's, you know, just getting into running or has only been running for a few years, or even for people who've been doing marathons for, you know, 15 years. Um, so one of the things, you know, I try to do when I lead our workout groups is I try to, all of our workouts are based off of time um, rather than distance. So that way, you know, it's just a really small thing. Um, and I've had multiple people in our club come up to me and be like, I'm really grateful our workouts are based off distance rather than time, or uh, sorry, time rather than distance, because it allows me to just run and do my workout and not worry about being the last person finishing the workout 15 minutes behind everyone else. Um, and it makes it more digestible for people. So that's one um, granular example. Another granular example of a way we try to create an inclusive space is we have runs that are, that are, um, women, women led, um, explicitly women led. So we'll call it like, you know, women run the herd, um, you know, we'll title certain runs, uh, and, and just try to create that space within the group. Um, and, and the last piece of learning that I think I had that's worth sharing is I remember I was, uh, I lead this like mo Wednesday morning workout session and I was always upset. Cause I was always like, we have like 10 guys and like some mo like one to two, females who show up, women who show up. And I'm like, what can I do to get more women in this workout group? And I was like, you know, I tried a few things and it's like, okay, yeah, we got a little bit better. I encourage women to participate. But the thing that made it the most, the most difference was that uh, I couldn't, I got hurt my Achilles. So I didn't show up for like three weeks or three months. And we had new people who had to lead the Wednesday workout morning session. And there was a, a young um, woman who kind of took up most of the slack and who started leading. And sure enough, since she started leading, like half of our participants and sometimes more than half are 
are women. So that's just a really good, a great example, right, of how um, mixing things up and providing a diverse group at the high end sometimes affects people um, and, and the, the, you know, encourages other folks to participate. Wonderful. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. And I uh, appreciate you uh, um, being the, uh, well, not, not the sole cis white guy here, but uh, um, thank you so much. That's true. Sorry, Terry. I should have acknowledged uh, you. Thank no, you. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah, yeah. We, we can talk about that offline, but um, no, thank you so much. I really appreciate you um, uh, stepping up and um, and being here. It's, um, I mean, I think, um, you know, the, uh, well, I, I just want to share um, some quick statistics. I know we're um, a little bit over time, so I'll keep this brief, but uh, um, so um, I shared with our panelists um, um, earlier today that uh, there was some research by the Department of Psychology at um, Colorado, sorry, California State University. Um, um, and it was uh, published in this year, earlier this year. Um, and they were looking at um, sexual harassment and sexual assault on the trails. And 61% of uh, respondents reported experiences of sexual health, sorry, sexual harassment or sexual assault, and primarily um, increases for women, non-binary, transgender, and gender fluid um, compared to men. Um, and in terms of the, the um, experiences with sexual health, sexual harassment, and sexual assault, then 52% of respondents felt less safe, 69% changed the way they ran, 25% um, did not change, and 4% are less likely to run. Um, so that's really, it, and it was a big sample too, it wasn't like a small sample. Um, so it was... Um, um, uh, yeah, it was really, uh, um, really important data. Patty, you could, sorry, you got a um, comment yeah, on I just, I have to add, because I, I've seen both sides. Yeah. Um, I had to change the way that I ran. I don't run at night. Yeah. I, but when I was at the beginning of uh, transition, I didn't feel comfortable running during the day either. Yeah. So I ran inside. I mean, there's, you know, there, it's for real. <laughs> and, and I, I don't know if I would have thought about that before, um, but it's something that it's hard to imagine, but it, it is it is a real issue and it's a real concern. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, it, it's um, I mean as a as a cis white guy, then it's like when when I first um, heard about these uh, um, some of these statistics, then it was like I, I cannot believe it's like I've never thought about what where I'm going to run. Um, what I'm going to be wearing, um, what I'm going to be looking like, is there going to be anybody else there? Um, you know, it just hasn't crossed my mind. And so it's, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, it, it's, uh, um, I think in closing then, oh, oh Kelsey, so you got to comment too. Go, go. Sorry, I'll just add, well, I think like, you know, your point brings up kind of ties back to what what all of us have been saying, right, is why it's really important as an organization, whether you're a race organization or a coaching organization or a run group um, to get really like into the nitty gritty with your community, right? What are these issues? What are the fears and how do we start to address them? Because it, again, it's not a one size fits all. And I think we really need to spend more time not only making a statement, you know, outwardly to people who engage in this community that that's not acceptable, but also empowering and, and equipping people with um, the tools so that they can feel safe, right? Whether that's navigation skills, the, the trail um, group runs, um, there are like safety things people can carry if that's really it. Um, I, think, I think there's just a number of ways to, to approach it. And I wanna make sure that, you know, we think about that as we, as we continue on in our world that we don't need to stand for this. Um, and I think there are many ways that we can, we can accomplish that. Brilliant. It's um, it's kind of mind-boggling almost for me sometimes that we're 2023 um, and we're, we're having conversations about uh, um, behavior towards women. Um, you know, <laughs> and it's, uh, um, but we, we, we are in this place. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I think the, uh, we've had some great ideas and um, suggestions from our panelists here and uh, 
Um, thank you to uh, um, to all four of you for your contributions, and uh, thank you so much for um, your time and, uh, and and sharing your wisdoms. Um, but it's uh, um, you know we're we're still in a situation where at the time being, then um, uh, we have a majority of, uh, of white cis guys um, who are race directing um, and organising races, and I think it's time that we um, uh, that we got together um, as a as a sport and uh, um, and turned um, turned the clock forwards and not kept it in the same place. Um, and uh, um, so, yeah, encourage everybody to uh, make changes. Um, you know, as uh, I think it was Patty alluded to, then you know we're. Um, uh, I think it's oh no, it may be funny in Kelsey. So forgive me. Um, that uh, um, uh, in terms of making mistakes, then you know we're not going to get this. Um, perfect first time. I think, Joe, you mentioned this as well. You know, it, it, I think it's much more important to be moving forwards with the intention um, of being, uh, creating a culture of respect for women on the trails. If we make mistakes, then that's great in some ways, because it means that, that we stand more chance of making success. If we stay still and don't do anything, then, you know, like Patty said, we're letting it slide and, and we shouldn't be doing that. Um, so thank you so much to everybody out there. Um, uh, wish you uh, um, safe, safe running. Um, uh, look after each other, and uh, um, uh, yeah, lots of love and respect to you all. Thank you to our panelists again, and uh, um, I'm going to stop the share. Oh, okay. Contact for Joe. Sorry, Joe. There we go. Yeah. So that will be on the slide deck as well. Um, yeah. So this was the last um, in our webinar series for this year. Um, uh, we'll be announcing plans later this year for 2024. And uh, um, for those of you that are interested, we still have some places left for the uh, trail running conference in October the 18th to the 20th in Makutio. And uh, Joe, I really hope you're going to be able to uh, join us again this year. Um, and uh, um, yeah, Kelsey, Kelsey, Patty, thank you so much. And I'm going to stop the share.